Today, uh, we have a presentation from uh, Dana Alzubi, uh, who is uh, from uh, Iowa State University. She's a third year PhD student in uh, educational technology there. And uh, this is a good opportunity for us uh, to uh, hear about uh, what they are doing, what she does, and uh, to have some uh, uh, idea from uh, the external uh, universities uh, about dashboard and educational dashboard. Um, Dana has a, a master in STEM education and a background in uh, chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, she has been uh, involved in uh, uh, human computer interaction, educational technology, and worked as an instructor and teaching assistant. Uh, so she has a, a good experience that uh, we are happy to uh, hear from. And she, uh, she is also in touch with uh, Society for Learning Analytics Research, uh, SOLAR. And she uh, was nominated, actually, uh, uh, one of the nominees for uh, the executive committee to represent uh, a PhD students. So we hope uh, that uh, uh, this uh, work uh, will be uh, very fruitful to her. And we are uh, looking forward to hearing more from her uh, work. So, Dana, uh, thank you for being here today. Over thank to you. And uh, for everyone, if you have questions, please use the chat panel and uh, uh, we'll uh, address them after the presentation. Thanks. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn my screen. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Alex, for this in, uh, introduction. And thank you for everybody for joining today on a Friday morning. It's evening time here for me uh, in the States. But I'm very excited to be sharing uh, my experience and uh, part of uh, our research and what we do in uh, here at Iowa State as part of uh, this project. So today I'll be presenting um, our research on designing a teach active feedback dashboard using a human-centered approach. And I'll be focusing a lot on the human-centered approach that we uh, adopted to, to design the dashboard. Uh, and as I said before, this is part of an NSF um, uh, project. I'll be talking uh, further on. So thank you, Alex, for, um, for like setting the floor and for uh, talking about uh, my expertise and like uh, my background so I don't have to go through this slide much. I will only mention uh, part of my research interest and where I feel my dissertation also is going through. So I'm very much interested in an overarching goal of improving uh, teaching and learning uh, by using innovative technologies and uh, using them uh, with the goal of uh, having uh, them continuously uh, improving uh, teaching and learning with some evidence about that. Uh, with that being said, I am interested in uh, human-centered uh, design approaches and uh, different um, uh, applications of learning analytics, so such as the dashboard that I'll be presenting today. And uh, more specifically, I'm very much interested in how instructors uh, teaching strategies and their methodologies can be informed uh, and improved by some evidence-based um, strategies and uh, evidence-based data from dashboards. So we know there's a lot of research on uh, dashboards from the perspective of students, and there's lots of uh, um, nowadays like uh, dashboards that are out there that look at students' learning processes. Um, my focus is more on instructors and how they look at um, uh, like those uh, data from dashboards and how they make sense of them and how they act accordingly. And I'm very much interested in this in both uh, in-class and online environments. So uh, the outline for today's talk will be, um, first, I give an overview of the whole Teach Active uh, uh, project, like the whole uh, NSF project, just uh, for you to set the ground uh, about uh, this um, the overarching goal of the project and how like we delved into the the uh, dashboard and then I'll um, I'll talk about the motivation of it and uh, I'll delve more deeper into the dashboard design with all its processes and conclusion with uh, some future steps. Uh, feel free please to ask any questions in the chat. I may not see the chat as I'm uh, sharing the screen but Alex can let me know if there's any question. If you want to interrupt me, feel free to do that or we can also keep the questions at the end. Um, I'm very flexible to have like both. So as I mentioned before, um, just like uh, an overview of uh, this whole NSF project, uh, the, uh, this NSF project is mainly aims on establishing a professional uh, development model, which is called Teach Active, uh, through three main components. And as you see here, there is the first component, active learning training. 
and it's where instructors go and they receive uh, training on uh, active learning strategies on some ways that they can integrate uh, active learning in their classrooms. Some examples of the whole concept of active learning if they are not familiar with it. And uh, they can do also some applications where they bring some examples of their lessons and then they implement some examples of active learning. So this is the first component. After they do that, uh, we have some cameras set in the classrooms. And this here comes the automated classroom observation where we implement, we deployed the system uh, that was developed by Carnegie Mellon uh, researchers. Uh, the system is called EduSense. And um, we, de we deployed the system in our like uh, premises at Iowa State. And with this, uh, we have cameras set in the classroom. Uh, one camera is facing the instructors and the other camera is facing the students. And then uh, instructors go and teach and then uh, the cameras capture some behavioral uh, uh, data from instructors that are happening in class. And then what we do is um, th these behaviors that are captured, they are visualized on the a dashboard. That is the third component of our uh, project. So uh, we designed the Teach Active dashboard as uh, part of this project, and it outputs the visualizations from this automated uh, classroom observation, uh, which is the EduSense. So it outputs them on the dashboard, and then we, uh, we seek to have a feedback and reflection from instructors on this dashboard. So mainly what I'd be focusing in this talk is about this component, which is like the whole human-centered design approach that we use to design uh, the dashboard. Uh, our research team, so uh, there are, uh, like this is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a project, a whole project that is also in the disciplinary. Uh, Dr. Avram Baran is an associate professor in School of Education. She's actually also my major professor, and uh, she um, I'm working uh, with her as part of this uh, project. So she's like uh, the PI of the project, and she like uh, um, she leads it and investigates how uh, instructors, engineering instructors, uh, really adopt the active learning uh, strategies and like uh, how this model, the impact of this whole teach active model on the reflective practices, etc. And Dr. Stephen Gilbert is from the College of Engineering and he's, uh, he's uh, leading the part on the user experience and uh, the teach active and ensuring that the system offers effective feedback. And Jamil is working uh, as a research assistant uh, with uh, Dr. Gilbert and he's uh, more on the technical side where he deploys the idiosense system and he designs the dashboard uh, uh, on the software uh, for that. And Dr. Elie uh, Karabult and Dr. Shan, uh, both of them are the leads of the active learning training, which is the first component. So they design the active learning training and they develop uh, uh, those uh, training materials to engineering faculty. And what I do is I, I mostly like, um, um, I'm on, on different parts of the project, but I mostly also uh, communicate with instructors, which are the users, and I gather uh, user requirements. I do uh, user walkthroughs, interviews, and then I do uh, um, uh, kind of take feedback from instructors and come back to Jamil with what, uh, what modifications to be done on the dashboard side, etc., so that he does the technical side also on that. So, um, so here I, I want to talk a little bit about the motivation behind this, um, this uh, whole like uh, teach active model and, and then talk about the design of the dashboard. So we all know that um, the, for effective implementation of evidence-based uh, uh, pedagogical strategies are really key for improving teaching and learning. And when we talk about evidence-based pedagogical strategies like um, we know that active learning, for example, is one of those uh, evidence-based uh, strategies that are key and that show through the research that they improve teaching and learning. Uh, but we also know that in a regular classroom, an instructor goes, they teach uh, in their class, and they receive null feedback about or null data about their own behaviors, and they uh, kind of recall very much little detail about their students' behavior. So it will be just like scatters that they recall few things and it wouldn't be really, they wouldn't be really much accurate about the accuracy of that. 
Uh, we also know, based on the research, that the feedback on instruction is one of the most effective mechanisms that is used uh, for instructors to improve their teaching skills. And usually and regularly what happens is people go and they provide peer feedback where they assess like how instructors are teaching and then they provide some kind of like a peer assessments and peer feedback. But having this human resource is really very uh, big and like it's a, it's a huge scale. So um, it's frequently like um, we, we keep asking ourselves like how much frequently do we go and teach in our classrooms or like instructors go and teach and receive feedback and how much of this feedback is really capturing specific behaviors and having some evidence from both instructors and students. So with that being said, um, we kind of like propose to provide an automated feedback about the classroom environment uh, that can bridge the gap between what instructors really recall about from their sessions and what their actual behaviors re really were. So we know there is a really critical need for research to bridge the gap between um, those pedagogical theories with the in-class uh, practices. And uh, with this comes the Teach uh, Active Feedback Dashboard, where it outputs um, some of the behavior um, indicators that are captured by the automated observation that I talked about before, which is idiosense. So, um, so with Teach Active Feedback Dashboard design, we implemented the human-centered approach. And um, we echo um, Sham and Martinez uh, Mal um, uh, Maldonado 2019's call for human-centered learning analytics as, um, as having an, an indispensable uh, impact for successful design solutions. So usually what happens, um, dashboards are being designed, designed by like um, uh, a technical people who uh, do the whole design of it and just launch this um, and then teachers or students or uh, whoever is the user take this design and they work with it. But what we really um, thought that would be helpful and we echo with that many of the learning analytics uh, uh, community and uh, the leaders in the field just, such as uh, Dr. Alyssa Wise, that uh, we are designing um, we are designing for humans with humans. So what really matters is that if we are designing for instructors, the dashboard, it's very important for us to understand the needs of this instructor and what they really want to see on the dashboard and what is really helpful for them and kind of walk them through the process of this design and understand if this is meaningful to them, if not, and do the modifications accordingly. So we, we uh, did this human-centered design approach, which was um, divided into five steps, five main steps. The first thing we did was needs analysis and I'll go through like in details for each one of them. And then we did some persona development. We developed the initial uh, prototype and then we did user uh, interviews and walkthroughs and finally some prototype iteration. It's very important to mention that that we did not go like when I was presenting uh, to instructors the first uh, prototype, it wasn't that um, I, I told them what do you imagine it to be and then they had to create something from scratch. Because we have a system and this we are bounded really by what the system can give us, like the system can give us certain behaviors and with this being said so it's not that anything they mention that they are interested in can be really implemented. So there are certain criteria for that. Um, I start with the needs analysis. So the first thing that we did uh, was a needs analysis. And um, for that, we wanted to understand first what are instructors' perspectives and understandings uh, about, uh, learn, uh, about active learning strategies? How frequently do they use them? Uh, what kind of um, active learning strategies do they use? So, so there are different like types of active learning strategies such as uh, project-based learning, one minute uh, peer uh, collaboration, et cetera. So which one of them do they use? Are, are they familiar with them? What's their knowledge base, et cetera. So we did this needs analysis and um, um, it was uh, sent to all people, all faculty in College of Engineering and we received uh, 53 response. And out of those, we also asked them for a follow-up uh, 
interviews. And there was um, four people who uh, agreed to do a follow-up interview where, where we asked uh, further in-depth questions about their teaching experience, what kind of classes they teach, and what are some specific reasons why they integrate active learning, uh, the, their goals, challenges, etc. And when uh, we did the analysis of the findings of this um, of this uh, needs analysis from the active learning, um, we compared it with uh, the the literature findings, and according to that, we developed some personas. So uh, the the findings of the analysis uh, and the um, and the interviews and uh, kind of validating them with the literature revealed four personas which are the agile, the seeker, the planner, and the feeler. And I wouldn't go into too much details uh, for each one of them, but I, I did uh, put the, each one, uh, each persona here. But I, it's, uh, it's worth mentioning that for each persona, it's the persona as if like um, we built this persona based on what instructors really um, uh, answered in their uh, questionnaire and in the survey and what the literature really says. And we realized that there are certain instructors who are really like uh, very much welcoming to being moving all over the classroom. And with this, they consider that this is what's active learning. Uh, there are other instructors that are uh, very much seeking recognition and seeking like um, to, to get uh, some awards or some certificates that they implemented active learning strategies, etc. And with this, they are very much interested in, um, in having like uh, active learning. And uh, there's the feel, the planner, the, those instructors really plan everything and they are kind of always aware and, um, and feel that there's uh, the time restraint where if they implement active learning strategies, it might take a lot of time. So they struggle to balance between the time of the lectures with whatever expected time there is. And there are types of instructors that are feelers who are really, um, like looking for some emotions and feelings. So if they perceive that active learning was very much perceived in a well way from their uh, students and you know, their students were, were like really happy with it, they get this as a positive feedback and they do it more often. But if it was vice versa and their students were not really like um, happy with the active learning and they felt, oh, it's a waste of time or, or so, so they just stopped there. So with those four personas, there is one common thing, which is they are all willing to see um, active learning and they all want to see visualizations that active learning is really effective in, uh, in their classrooms. So when asked, for example, about uh, what kind of visualizations they would like to see from their classrooms, it was mostly that they want to see that this worked, this is effective, and if it is so, we will be integrating more active learning. So from these four personas, we developed our first uh, prototype, uh, dashboard prototype, and it was on uh, Adobe XD. So this was our first uh, prototype. And again, I will say that this is kind of bounded by what the system can bring us. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up of why those metrics, because those metrics are kind of what also EduSense, which is the automated observation uh, system gives us. But I'll walk you through this um, um, dashboard, like this first prototype. So let's say you went and you taught your um, your um, session, and then you come back and you receive this um, this display. So on this display, you see that there is a session uh, display and there is a progress display, and there is one that is view C. This is just like an extra one that we added, just like to make sure we can add uh, stuff. And under session. Uh, there are different like uh, sessions which are marked by the the um, the date. So let's say you are on October first, uh, twenty twenty, and you receive that uh, you have the hand raises are eleven, and then the instructor's speech is twenty minutes, the student's speech is thirty minutes, and the st uh, student performance is six. And then there is this uh, pane of student engagement where you see four different categories. They are um, passive, active, constructive, and interactive. And there's this scatter plot of facilitation behavior. And there is the progress pane, uh, display which shows 
uh, some kind of comparisons between scatter plots and some kind of different sessions. So you see here like the hand raise, uh, the instructor speech, uh, student speech, and uh, the performance under the four different sessions. So this was our first prototype, and this was based on what EduSense can really bring to us. So EduSense can give us like the hand raises, the instructor speech, student speech, and student performance. And while looking at the literature and looking at the personas, we realized that student engagement based on an ICAP framework that is for active learning divides student engagement into four categories. And those are the four categories. And this was the facilitation behavior that is kind of uh, based as you see the color code so it's based on those four metrics. So the red one would be for the instructor speech, and then the green one would be for the student speech, and then the student performance. Um, it's worth mentioning that the hand raises was not part of the facilitation behavior because it's different frequencies. Like those two are minutes, but this one is kind of a different frequency. So I I took this um, first prototype and I did some. Uh, user walkthroughs and user interviews with the instructors. Um, so we did with um, six instructors. Six instructors is a kind of um, uh, an accepted proportion for the, the total number of instructors that we have. We want to do for the whole like project, which is uh, around thirty instructors. So with the user walkthroughs, I went them. Uh, I went. Um, I walked them through the whole like uh, design. This one. I, uh, I sent them the, the link of Adobe XD and the same thing that I explained right now, but I went like more thoroughly through each metric. And now for the sake of time, I couldn't, I can't do that. But I explained each and every metric and how does it come from? And I asked questions such as like, do you find this helpful? Uh, what would you like to see, for example, based on this? What is something that you think that is challenging? Are you concerned about anything, etc.? So I kind of discussed with them each and every part of the visualizations and tried to understand how they perceive the usefulness of these uh, metrics. And with that, um, we developed the second prototype. So you see um, the major change happened between the first prototype and the second prototype. Because first, like uh, when we talked about student engagement and there were those four categories, the uh, passive, active, uh, and interactive and the constructive, uh, we realized that those are not really measurable. Like what if, how would I say that this instructor, for example, was within the zone of active? And then how do I put it within the zone of passive, et cetera? So this wasn't something that can be manageable and can be done. So we did um, many changes from the first prototype to the second prototype based on uh, periodic meetings that we the meet met together and based on the findings from the user walkthroughs. And I talk about mainly the basic um, uh, change like the the most highlighted changes that we did. So first thing, we said that it's very important for instructors um, to see from one session to another the changes that are happening, just for them to understand. Okay, um, I talked, for example, the hands raised were like uh, increased by two for this session, or my uh, my speech this session decreased by three minutes versus the student speech increased by five minutes. And then the class performance, we realized it shouldn't be like um, just points. It should be like a percentage because it's the average of the whole class performance. So we added that also. So for the metrics, we also added for instructor speech and student speech um, this um, small bar that you see here. And it kind of uh, shows like this out of the total, it visualizes it because like there is 39 out of 50, but as if this whole like bar is 50 minutes and you can see how much talk is uh, out of the whole like 50. And then um, instead of student uh, engagement, we, uh, we replaced that by in-class activity. So under in-class activity, there are two metrics, and that's why you see here two graphs, just like to represent those two metrics. The first metric is this one, which is sit versus a stand. So over here, it shows the, um, the proportion of students sitting versus standing. And 
for this metric is um, very important to mention that during the active learning training and during like the um, the whole um, talking with instructors, we realized that when they implement active learning activities, students are moving around back and forth. So it's worth seeing that, for example, and this is fake data, but it's just like for us to kind of recognize. Uh, over here, you can realize that uh, students are standing, like the proportion of students standing is increasing, which means or which might indicate for me that this is the time where some active learning is taking place or some activity is taking place. And then um, for the for the other metric that is under in class activity, it would be the instructor movement. So as you see this bubble graph, uh, it shows where the instructor is moving throughout the the um, the time of the class. So you see, for example, over here, the biggest um, uh, circle, the biggest bubble is over here. So if I as an instructor look at this, I may realize that throughout my class, I'm kind of uh, focusing a lot on this side. And I'm like very much in this um, side. And then um, over here, those gray, um, those gray uh, rectangles that you see. So this one is the behavior engagement. It shows the metrics that are over here, which are the hand raises, the instructor speech, and the student speech, but over time. So instead of it showing, let's say that the student talked for 11 minutes, it shows that where were the student talks throughout the 50 minute class time. So at like minute uh, 20 students were talking for two minutes, etc. So it shows like a scatter plot throughout the time. And what uh, what I received from the from the um, user walkthroughs was that it will be very helpful if instructors can add manually, and this is where the gray area is, uh, when did they do the activity? Because they do recall the time of the activity or they do recall approximation of the time of the activity. And then they can see if the patterns are different. And of course here, like it's, uh, it's kind of how we visualize them. So we put those two gray uh, rectangles where the active learning was happening because the patterns are kind of different. And for the progress, uh, for the progress session, um, you see there are like uh, three uh, main um, bars, which are the instructor speech, the student speech, and the hand raises. And what we really seek here is like over here, we are as if showing you four sessions, and you uh, instructors can compare. Um, the green and the red are instructor speech and student speech, so they can compare like their speech versus their student speech over those four sessions. But again, we cannot compare the student speech and instructor speech with hand raises because they have different like Y axis. They have the hand raises are more of a frequency versus the instructor and the student speech are minutes. So that's why these are comparisons. So that was the second prototype. And then with the third prototype comes a very important aspect and component for our uh, project also, which is reflection. So. So what, for example, you might say, okay, instructors spoke for 39 minutes out of 50. So what, is that good? Is that bad? Does research say anything is good about that or anything is bad and what's good and what is bad? So we realized that it's very important uh, to understand the context because I might be speaking for 39 minutes, but while explaining a lesson, or I might be like just lecturing, or I might be answering questions for students. So we started these reflection prompts or like kind of like what prompts come out uh, from that idea. And then we um, asked like those uh, prompts after each like um, after each uh, uh, metric. So let's say we tell the instructor, you spoke for 39 minutes, are you happy with this? And if they said no, then we can prompt them to, to set a goal. So we developed this into a more, um, like a more uh, of a whole new uh, um, display. So we have the session display, we have the progress display, and then we added a whole display that is called reflection prompts. And under this display, for each session, it provides like um, uh, shortcuts of the hand raises, for example, they are 11. And then within this, it shows them this image and then it, it's, it asks those questions. The students mainly raised their hands during the session. 
to ask questions or like clarifications or to participate in class discussions or we keep also uh, an open-ended uh, answer which is other so why we do this is because it's very important to understand the context of what's happening in the class and what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the data that is coming from those visualizations tell a story. Like we want to understand the different stories from each instructor. So students were raising their hands and there are different reasons for students to raise their hands. It might be that an indicator of active learning, but it might be an indication also of them not understanding or it might be another uh, X, Y, Z um, reason. So for this, under each, um, under each metric, we add like those prompting questions. And with those questions, we ask them if they wanna set a goal. And I think this is also one of the very important and prominent parts of the dashboard, because we understand that data by itself might be misleading, data by itself might lead to misconceptions uh, and data by itself might not be meaningful. So we're trying to really make some meanings out of this data and some interpretations and to understand how instructors are making sense of this data and what's next. So if they, for example, perceive that uh, they spoke a lot in this session, what are they going to do next? Are they gonna set a goal for themselves to speak less? Or are they gonna set a goal for themselves to uh, make students engage more? So those reflections are kind of trying to understand this part and they kind of ask those questions where do you want to set a goal for next time and then if they say yes we ask what is this goal and for each goal we ask a follow-up question for uh from from each session from one session to another did you meet your goal and we kind of give them their goal versus the expectation that they had versus the reality just like to keep up with that and um, after like, um, this is actually what the current version of the Teach Active Dashboard is looking like. Uh, this is uh, a pilot. We did pilot on four instructors uh, this semester and we're implementing it next semester. So uh, with the pilot, we added also attendance and we're kind of um, looking, as I mentioned, for the reflection prompt. And after uh, instructors add those reflections, I do a final, uh, semi-structured interview with them where I kind of ask them uh, prompting questions or give them some like, for example, I give them this uh, screen. And of course, I will choose ones that are really attentive, like that, that are really showing some patterns. And I kind of ask them to, to reflect on that and to understand like, why was this happening? Is this something that they expected? If yes, why? If not, why not? Etc. So these are kind of the things that uh, um, we're looking for. And so for the conclusion and for the future steps, uh, it's very important uh, to, um, to, to kind of like understand that what we are trying to do with the Teach Active Feedback ta Dashboard is to provide evidence that links uh, the active learning strategies, which are like, um, which are, a pedagogical perspective to the in-class practices and to support instructors implementation and facilitation of active learning strategies. Now we understand that change is very hard. Like it's not that we are implementing this for four weeks and then like from week one to week four, there will be a bump of change, but even small changes are very much worse, uh, like uh, worthy to see. And even like understanding how they interpret the data from their classrooms and what data is meaningful from their classrooms and what data might not really be meaningful. And it's very important to mention that what might be meaningful to one instructor based on their context of teaching might be different from other instructor who has a different um, uh, context of teaching. So what I presented was the initial design process of this um, uh, Teach Active Feedback Dashboard and uh, our human-centered design involves the instructors throughout this design process and I think this is also one of our like um, uh, things that that uh, is very important for the, the field and it's very important for 
looking into how users can be involved in the design of dashboards because users are the the ones who will be using them so it's very important for them to be involved in the process to understand the process and to kind of um like give all their feedback so that we can improve those uh, things and our next steps will be including um, to evaluate the whole system and to implement it uh, like our actual implementation. We did the pilot this uh, semester and our actual implementation will be in our future semesters. So with this being said, I think I reached to discussions and questions. Am I on time? That's perfect. Yeah. Thank <laughs> okay. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a very clear presentation of your work and uh, that uh, indeed uh, uh, brings uh, many questions and, uh, and, and more food for thought. Um, while maybe our, uh, our colleagues are uh, uh, preparing their question, just some very uh, technical ones. Can you just remind us uh, uh, the age of students, the kind of students that uh, you were working with? Yeah, sure. So actually also like student, it's very important. Um, this part, the IRB part was very complex one. It's very much important to mention that because uh, the whole project is not about um, having students as participants. It was more about having the instructors. They are the participants. We are looking at their facilitation behaviors, but we are involving some data from uh, students. And this data actually, uh, I did not mention that I should have mentioned that is all aggregated. So we do not really look at any individualized student data. So if it is, let's say, hand raises, it's cum accumulating like the, uh, the total uh, number of hand raises during the class. And it does that through open polls. If it is, maybe I should stop sharing and then uh, so that I can see you all. Okay, one second. Okay, yeah. So so if it is um, if it's um, like the hand raises, the student speech, instructor speech, etc. So it all looks at those as an aggregated data. So we could not um, uh, do like uh, this whole system was very complex in the aspect that we had to uh, in, uh, include cameras in the class. And let's say we included the cameras and students said uh, we do not consent. So we would not be able like to get data from, from this class. So we ended up uh, agreeing with the IRB to notify students that there is this study going on and none of their data is going to be um, like revealed. None of the individualized data is out there. It's all about instructors adopting these strategies and looking at aggregated data and instructors are the ones who are looking at the data of the students, but none is individualized. With this being said, the students are all above 18. So they are all like um, undergrads or sophomore, sophomore or like, uh, uh, yeah, undergrads in engineering uh, education. So they are in engineering classrooms. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, we have already two other questions from Eduardo and uh, from uh, John Tazen. Hi, Dana. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have, I guess, uh, maybe a reaction first to what you just said. If the data is aggregated, how do you distinguish them between a classroom setting where you could have a student dominating the, the conversation, maybe asking one question after another versus a truly sort of participatory and engaging teaching experience where you have different students uh, sharing and, and asking questions. So that's one, one thing. The other thing, and I think you also touched upon it um, just now, but as you were talking about the dashboard, I kept thinking that I would want, if I was using the dashboard, I would want to be able to then have a link maybe to an audio feed or a video feed to contextualize what was happening at that particular point. But I think you just mentioned that that's not possible because of IRB uh, concerns. So I feel like that, to me at least, it takes away from the value of the dashboard and the potential for an instructor to, to annotate you know, what, what they did and why they did it at that particular point and uh, help them with that reflexivity that you, you talked about. So anyway, so those, those are two initial uh, questions or reactions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, questions and points. And they are very important, I think, and they are um, very significant. So first to touch on um, 
if all students or none. So this is actually um, part of something that is a dependency in our system. So our system depends on the idiosense system that was um, that was developed by Carnegie Mellon. And their algorithm, what it does, it actually computes the the uh, the instructor as like um, because instructors usually usually have like a higher pitch or higher amplitude than uh, others. So it's instructor versus others. So all of the others are together for their audio and the instructor is one. So I think that it's very important, the, the point that you touched on, that it might be one student who is always interacting. And then you might think that, oh, the student's speech is uh, very, but this is also where the reflection comes and where when we are asking questions about where students participating, the instructor can be reflecting on that and like mentioning it was one student, etc. So this is where we are kind of trying to have data tell us some stories of what was mm -hmm. happening in class. For the other point that you touched on, so uh, this project, when we started, we did this IRB, it was really very complex. It took a long time for it to launch and et cetera. <laughs> and then for, for the pilot part, we did realize this importance, the, important of, the importance of the point that you have mentioned. Um, and we're kind of as a team now discussing what, where to go from. So it's very important, as you mentioned, for an instructor to go back and look at like, even if it was kind of like an excerpt that I can bring because I see, let's say the data is telling me something on this point. But then what we will have to do is we will have to go back to IRB and say, okay, the videos will not be automatically deleted because this part was like the videos are automatically deleted. And that's why we are not uh, like, we're not getting consent. Mm -hmm. We are rather having them notify us, but then if we do this, go with that route, we will have another barrier, which would be if one student does not consent in a class and we inserted the cameras and we set up the whole system, then we cannot even collect data from that. So it's kind of like now balancing which one would be on like the, the side of what do we pick, uh, what, what, which, which side to pick. <laughs> and I think like um, Dr. Abram uh, Baran, like the PI with the other team members are consulting right now on that to see if this is a possibility. But you're right about that. I think it's very important for them to look at those specific moments, touch on them and then see what was happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, so we had a question from uh, Jonta, uh, Jonta. Maybe uh, if you want to uh, unmute yourself or... Yeah, um, so thanks so much for sharing. Uh, I hope it's not too late over there. Um, I have just quick Google and I find an answer on my own question, but I have a follow up where um, maybe from the teacher, when you approach them from like level one, like starting point until they got comfortable with like, using a technology and participating <laughs> In the, in, the, in the research project. How long is that timeline, if you may, if you may share? Sure. Okay, so, um, so the, the instructors do not teach, uh, do not like use the IDEOSense per se, like the IDEOSense is deployed and they use the dashboard, but it is a long process. So the st starting recruitment, so we start by asking instructors if they are interested in, in getting into this uh, research. And it started actually in August. Like it started in August, we started like talking about this project to other instructors and saying that, uh, that this NSF is uh, awarded and we are interested in this. Uh, uh, and we started recruiting and we talked about it a little bit. And then uh, we started like at the same time uh, doing the IRB. Once we got the IRB, which took a very long time, like we got the IRB in February, which was uh, quite a long time due to the different, like the complexities of the whole system. And um, we recruited instructors and we did the active learning training in February. And then we did the launching of, um, of the IDEOSense with the dashboard in April. So it kind of took like two months because we were deploying the system also like at the same time in parallel. So I would say that always because it depends on what cameras you're putting in the classrooms and how like you are, um, because you have like to do some trainings with the instructors, it always have to be you touching base with instructors one semester before just to make sure they're interested and they are like looking forward to that and are uh, are up to all these steps. And then 
after that, uh, once the system is ready in the uh, in the classrooms, we do the the whole implementation uh, in four weeks time. And in four weeks time, instructors usually teach twice to three times per uh, week. So once they teach um, uh, like those sessions, they directly get um, after they're they're teaching the link to the dashboard, not directly as in like instantly. If they teach 50 minutes, the system takes 50 minutes to process the data and analyze it. So it's kind of like takes uh, the same amount of time. Um, I just want to zoom in on the human factor. Like, I guess if I paraphrase my question, how long does it, does it take for the instructor to feel comfortable with this tracking technology on them? Um, mentally or like a comfort level in using the technology? How how long like will they be comfortable to be using it? Sorry, you're muted. I think. Yeah, from the start when they're very new to the technology until they got comfortable in using the technology, how long is that timeline? Yeah. So. So they are using the dashboard only, and the right. dashboard and the dashboard uh, is a simple link that like I walk them through, they just like use, uh, like you use in Canvas username and password. So they just log in their username and password. And before they use it, I just like walk them through the whole steps and like everything uh, uh, that they have to do. And I'm not sure if, because uh, like they are very much technology aware and they use those technologies, but I didn't feel it took them a long time for them to to kind of like catch up with this technology because with a dashboard it was just like click on this metric click on this and then they see the whole like page of the metrics and then for the reflection they just add the stuff that are either qualitatively or liquid scale but if you mean the whole technology as what's happening in the classroom and the tracking they are not involved in this process they just go and teach so like the, behind the scenes the it people and the people like uh, who were installing the cameras and the technical person who was working on deploying the system were running this whole process but they were just going and teaching and the system automatically records what they are teaching in the classroom like we scheduled it to record uh, at specific times the times that they are in the classroom so basically the technology that they use is just the link to the dashboard and i did not perceive that to be uh, at all like a barrier for, for them, uh, to be honest. And thanks so much for the sharing. You're welcome. I think someone also has a question. Yes, uh, we have uh, Eduardo, maybe uh, someone else in the... Uh... Happy, yeah, if there are other questions, I'm happy to wait or... Well, if not, I'll go, <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, I was thinking, uh, Dana, um, well, two, two, I guess maybe two related comments. One is uh, if you could elaborate the role of the personas in this whole project, and then how, how do you link this project to sort of teaching versus learning in the sense that uh, there is a certain, I guess, assumption uh, embedded within the, the whole project that if, if you use this technology, the students will learn more or will learn better. And I can imagine someone saying, well, I teach the way I teach and I don't need my students to raise their hands or talk and they're gonna learn just as much or be even better than going through these uh, sort of uh, items or these prompts that you added to a dashboard. So how do you deal with that? Because I feel like the, I can imagine pushback saying, well, that's, this is not about learning. This is simply a case of, uh, again, how many, uh, how many kids move around in my room or how many kids raise their hands? And that's just not how we teach X. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, thank you again for your point. So one thing that I need like to uh, point out also is that we are at this phase exploring also the technology. I, I am definitely not at the phase of saying, oh, this improves teaching and learning, that's for sure. 
But we are with the idea that uh, technology innovations and um, those, um, like all the technologies that can be used with some evidence may improve teaching and learning. And with this being said, the link between the project, like the link between teaching and learning is that especially within the active learning uh, strategies, the literature uh, mentions that uh, when, when active learning is happening in classrooms, students are more engaged. And we all know that when students are more engaged, the, the outcomes usually are better. Of course, there are always like students who are more engaged, but not cognitively engaged. So it might not be the case for those students. But as an as a nutshell, like the ultimate goal would be to have uh, to have instructors probably uh, be more aware of what they are doing in class rather than saying this is right and this is makes this makes like learning happen in a better way. So our first exploration stage is this technology and this like dashboard will provide them feedback to be aware and to explore, are they aware that this is happening in their classroom? Are they aware, for example, that they are talking that much? Are they aware that these things were happening? That's like at the very beginning. And then if they were not aware, then what changes this might bring and what kind of like things that might bring for them to reflect on and like to change in their habits or in their way of their teaching, etc. So with an ultimate goal looking at the learning, but as you mentioned, like it's not that uh, this is going to be like as a click <laughs> and then once they use this technology students will learn better. It's rather, uh, it's rather them looking at uh, certain things that you and the human mind does not really recall. So I go and teach really in my classroom. And sometimes if you ask me, how did you teach? I'd say, oh, excellent. I, I really taught like perfectly today. Or I might remember like small things. I might not remember things. So what this technology, what this like dashboard can bring and this feedback can bring is certain like patterns or certain like things that the human mind or like your eyes really don't capture and then moving from there seeing okay with this data what kind of changes can you do to improve your teaching that will lead to improving learning etc so that's kind of like my answer to that but again i don't have a quite um a sharp answer for how will this and you are right about certain things that happen during learning and certain instructors of course we we all know that there are certain like um, instructors that think that okay I am teaching in this way and students are learning and I'm not willing to change anything and this is like the whole like peak and those people will probably not be part of the project because they will not be willing to be part of it right so maybe people who will be willing are people who are like very much motivated to do some change or very much motivated to to look at some innovations and technologies etc and this is kind of, I understand that it might be a pushback, but it's the, the reality of how things are. This could you is say, the, sorry, Dana, could you say a few words about how the personas work within the uh, project? Thank you. Yes, sure. So uh, for the personas, uh, before like, before um, before we started even like with instructors and, and going and like, uh, we want to launch this whole like dashboard etc so we kind of wanted to understand what kind of users do we have like who are those people that we will be really um like developing the dashboard for and uh, kind of like interacting with etc and before knowing our users uh, we kind of did this needs analysis and that was part of the pool of those uh, instructors because the needs analysis was uh, on the engineering faculty and some of those engineering faculty are the people who whom are like working with us on the project who are participating so to understand those um uh, like what kind of barriers they might have what kind of expectations they might have we build those personas so this those personas are not like uh a reality but it was the very beginning where mm. we needed to launch our initial prototype so we kind of like sat together and said okay we have the planner or x for example might be a planner so how would this planner look at the dashboard and see like what would they like to see and then we added like this visualization of the engagement let's say so it's kind of our starting point to build the initial prototype because literature says, and like, um, it's very important, according to others, not to 
to go to users without anything in hand and say, oh, okay, what what kind of dashboard do you want? Like at least we need to, we needed to have an initial dashboard and to develop that we couldn't like it it wasn't something that you want to develop for anyone it has to be for certain personas that are people who are using active learning yeah it seems like a a, a very smart approach to uh, a colleague's uh, user's needs before developing the technology rather than the, the other way around maybe uh, a last question a short one from uh, Srinivas before we we leave uh, dana go uh, <laughs> this is already late in the... yeah i think uh, i got answer for uh, my question uh, which is uh, closely related to what uh, ecuador asked regarding learning and complexities associated with learning while we apply this technology in the classroom so thank you so much for bringing that i think many of us will have the similar questions about how evidence can be collected from the learning point of view although we can teach whether th with this technology or without technology uh, when a teacher is very spontaneous and extemporaneously nice teacher to implement active learning strategies and then to engage students actively. And uh, we always uh, not sure that, you know, whether the students are learning or not. Hmm? So their behaviors may not or may not be promising uh, that they have learned unless we test it out and then we can make some assessments before and after. Mm -hmm. So my, my comment is uh, this is teach active. Probably you can also couple learn active. Yeah, yeah, probably that will be our next step. It's also worth men mentioning that uh, we have a metric that is the class performance, as your average class performance, but the instructors add this manually. So uh, we tend like to, we gave this as a, also um, as like an open thing for instructors if they felt that they want to also track if, um, if um, like students, uh, performance was better due like to certain changes or something so they can also like track that as part of the metrics but yes as you mentioned it's very important to look at uh behaviors and like to keep trying what what might work and uh kind of uh like this is our overarching goal and um thank you very much for your comment yeah i can understand i mean yes Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, information, which is very useful, like, you know, integrating uh, humanizing and then artificial intelligence or machine learning, whatever in the classroom. But one point is motivation levels, you know, when the students know that they are monitored using cameras through mm -hmm. EduSense or whatever, I think the behaviors, they definitely uh, will go out of natural way of they do, you know, since they are monitored, the behaviors will be just for the sake of monitoring. And uh, would that be continued when there is no such sensors in the classroom? So yeah. these are such questions. Mm. Yes, I, I, I agree with your point about the motivation levels. So what research says is that when students know that they are like, uh, there is like uh, some kind of cameras or stuff, the first session or so will be uh, kind of like based on the camera, but then they tend to forget that this is happening. Even us, like when I am, for example, recording, when the pandemic happened, I started recording. And then my first recording was kind of, I was panicking a little bit, but then I kind of forgot that it was a recording and stuff. And then I got like more into the, that loop. So the, the motivation or like the novelty of anything might be shocking. And even to instructors at a very uh, start, but then when it continues for some time, we kind of like uh, believe that it might not be the case, especially right now. So it's not that those cameras, those cameras are specific because they um, they include the EduSense, like the system deployed, but the classrooms that we were uh, also implementing in them, they already had cameras that are used for other purposes because it's an online class and a face-to-face -face class. Mm -hmm. So the the this part of the cameras, especially when the pandemic happened, was kind of something that students are getting used to it. So that was for our like advantage, I, I would say. But hopefully that this will not be a barrier for their like uh, motivation, especially that when we notify them, like we uh, we assure that nothing that is shared will be like on a video, nothing that uh, of their individualized data will be there, nothing will affect their grades. Like we have to uh, emphasize those things just for them to make sure. And if they have any questions or confusions or clarifications, they come to us to ask those questions. So. I think I think like we we try to do all these things, but I, as you mentioned, it might be, especially at the very beginning, kind of like a stimulator for something else.
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Because finally, uh, teaching and learning is a very complex uh, interaction in the classroom. So there is no single foolproof answer. Thank you so much for exploring this and sharing this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Dana. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, very clear on your project and uh, the, the work. And uh, uh, it's very, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of different uh, from uh, what we are doing at uh, NUS and it helped us uh, to think uh, out of the box as well and to see some other perspective on these uh, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much and uh, help me to uh, uh, give a, a round of uh, electronic applause uh, to, uh, to Dana <laughs> uh, before we, we let her go. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. It was my pleasure, really. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. <laughs>